all to our session uh, on our Friday seminar on disability, gaming and children's wellbeing. Uh, I wish to begin by acknowledging the Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land upon which I and Katie gather today, um, and to the traditional custodians of the many lands upon which we're all um, gathering and meeting today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. I also extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be in this meeting today with us as well. So just briefly to introduce the session, um, it's been set up by the Equity, Diversity, Justice and Inclusion Portfolio in the Centre of Excellence to explore the benefits of online gaming for children with a disability. This matter arose for me in a separate research project when the mother of an eight-year-old boy with a learning disability started to outline the the benefits of gaming for her for her son through his online gaming activities, basically. And these benefits included communications, the ability to process information, and mathematics, mathematics skills as well, just to name a few of those things. I was taken a little bit by surprise how easy she could articulate and, and clearly state what those benefits were. Um, so today I want to welcome Professor Katie Ellis, who is Australia's foremost scholar on disability and digital media. Katie is at Curtin University in Perth and is the Director of the Centre for Cultural Technology at Curtin University and a Professor of Internet Studies in the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry. One of her most recent co-edited co -edited books, um, Gaming Disability, explores the opportunities and challenges people with disabilities experience in the context of digital games and from the perspective of three related areas, representation, access and inclusion and community. Um, today's session should allow Professor Ellis to introduce some of those concepts covered in her books. I'm just going to hand over to Rebecca now. Um, hi everyone, we're actually here at the University of Wollongong um, and I would also like to begin by acknowledging Dara people who are the traditional custodians on which, and then on which I'm very fortunate to meet Anthony and his family um, today and also pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present and emerging. So Anthony is actually a game developer, so I'm very, very excited um, and his master's thesis looked at how disability is represented in various media formats. Yes. Um, you know, ranging from games to film. You know, and yes, I, I understand um, everything in between. Yeah, and you examined how media cultivates a specific view of disability, allowing disabled people to be marketed. And, yes. and so I'm really fascinated by this. And, and it's great that we can lead with um, this introduction because what I want to understand from your perspective is what is the significance of gaming to children? Um, well, there's growing up the way I did with uh, being separated from most from most people's gaming gave me an outlet to be myself, and as online gaming came into being in the in the nineties, well, it started yeah started in roughly the nineties mid nineties. Um, I found a community, mm. um, and from there it just the community has grown and it's become. A quite quite large part of society today, the online communities. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and, and what's the <coughs> what's the significance to you when you were growing up? Um, well, uh, to again, it's the the outlet, the social interaction, the closest you can get to having a social interaction over the internet. Uh, you'd have uh, a lot of the games I played. I'd have. Uh, Chat, uh, chat systems and they also have a uh, blog system so people can chat to each other when they're not playing the game yeah, and whatnot. Um, and a community did did build up around that. Um, and as gaming has been, has become more involved and in, uh, more technology where the the because the capability of that community has increased. Um, uh, one of the games that one of the games I play quite regularly is that uh, it's, it has a build system. Uh, it's not just the interaction with other, other people in, in, game, uh, in the game when you're doing group content, but also you've got your, your build, which is a more closely knit community uh, and you sort of have meetups every once in a while mm -hmm. and uh, talk to people inside channels outside the game. And, yeah. 
Um, so it's it is largely community and socially based now, rather than when I started growing up. Yeah, that's really a thing. Yeah, Katie, what do you, what do you think? What's the significance of gaming to children, and why does it matter? Okay, well, I think Anthony's answer that it is a, a site where people can be included and find community and participate in a way that they might not be able to in the wider world is a really great starting point for thinking about and talking about these issues. So um, in our book, Gaming Disability, which was actually co-edited with Tama Lever, who's in the room, um, so I acknowledge his contribution, and uh, Professor Mike Kent, also from Curtin. So in that book, we looked at three different areas and reasons why gaming matters to people with disabilities. So first of all, we thought about access and how important it is to make sure that games are accessible to people with disabilities because this sends a message, a really clear message about belonging and participation. And as an academic, um, I like to think about this in terms of the New South Wales inclusive playground movement who have a framework for understanding how this work and it's it's really simple it's um can I get there can I play there can I stay there and this is really about making sure people with disabilities children with disabilities can access games and feel welcome there and find find people to interact with there as Anthony was talking about so um making sure games are accessible to children with disabilities both in terms of adaptive technologies and the attitudes that circulate in the game can send a message about whether or not you're included or whether you, or not you're not included. And so um, this, the second area we looked at in the book was around inclusive communities and the way people with disabilities can establish inclusive communities around particular games and game platforms. So some research with the eSafety Commission has just has found that for children with disabilities, Roblox and Minecraft are the most used online games. And through these games, children are doing exactly what Anthony talked about earlier, talking to one another, forming friendships and finding inclusion. So finally in the book, and this is where I started to become interested in disability and gaming is, um, representation. So whether or not people with disabilities are represented in games. And it's it's just so important for children with disabilities to see themselves represented in games, right? But it's also so important for children without disabilities to see children with disabilities in games so that they can come to see that disability is a normal part of every environment that they might find themselves in. So that brings us to the second question, which Katie, I was going to throw to you, but you just answered. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to move on and, and ask Anthony, from your perspective, Anthony, why is it important for kids to see representation of disability ref reflected in games? Um, sense of self would be in, in, a, in a single, single sentence, uh, I'll expand on that. Um, Character, characters are supposed in, in narrative games, particularly, characters are supposed to represent a part of yourself. So you can impart yourself on the character and so it becomes visceral. Um, like, so if, uh, if I can die in a game, like, what happened to me? That's, that's, the, what's the, that's the general, it's like, not what happened to the character, what did I do? to cause this, why did this happen to me? Why, why do I stand in the fire kind of thing? Uh, so it is, it's, it's a visceral connection to the character um, and the easier it is for the player, the player to see themselves in the character, the more of a, of a visceral connection I'll have to the character. Um, and in terms of, disability, disabled characters, there's just not a whole lot there and the ones that there are, there's a, the, the ones that are, that I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say they're the best, but they're better than a lot of the other stuff. Uh, uh, I can think of a few where um, 
I wouldn't say yes, this has done really well. And I, more than a few that would say, no, I think this has not done well at all. Um, there's just no, no connection to the character at all. Um, and there's just, there's no thought that way into it. It's just thrown in just for the sake of it kind of thing. Um, and then this is this kind of leads us to this next aspect, right? You said you talked about representation, yeah. And 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 I wonder, you know, how is disability kindly represented in games, toys, you know, popular media in general? Um, in general, and this is a very broad statement. Uh, in general, I would say it's not. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, but not yeah. in general. Uh, with few exceptions, um, uh, some of the games that I play that uh, they've got disabled characters in them and it's like they've, they've done well, we consider done well because the way the, the disability that they have has other ones in real, in real life and, the, and someone who's playing they can say to themselves, hey, this is me. I experienced something similar to this, so they have that visceral connection to the character um that to me is good representation and just the, again there's not a whole lot of that um can be done better um and that's mostly on the studios for not putting any more thought into yeah. the character design yeah um because um i I think that's because um, they go for the path of least, least resistance. Mm. Um, because if they include a character that has a disability, you're going to have a group of people that are going to have a go at them. So you're just doing this for brownie points, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, you're not listening to your players and, and whatnot. And then You've got the other side, where uh, if it's done poorly, then you're going to have disabled community come down with them as well. Yeah. So for that reason, I think that for the most part, they just don't bother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Katie, what do you what do you think? I understand that you've done some research in some of the characters that's been represented in games. Yeah. Um. I just would like to make the point that twenty percent of the population have a disability that's a very large minority group. So we, we should be seeing, you know, 20% of the population being represented in media and popular culture and games. And that's probably one of the key reasons why representation is important. Um, I'm gonna take a slightly different um, tact in responding to, to this question because I think representation of disability in games and toys is really changing and, and increasing, um, particularly at different moments in time. So in my, in my research, I look at popular culture and broadly disability broadly. And what, what I'm finding is that representations of um, disability in children's media and toys are really culturally specific and tied to particular moments in time and what's, what's going on at that time. So, for example, times when disability is more visible in society. <clears throat> a, key, um, a key example of this is around the Vietnam War. I'm starting to lose my voice. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, just around the Vietnam War, disability started being represented in action figure toys because we, we started seeing more men with just coming back from wars with disability. So this was being represented in, you know, G.I. Joe, and there was another action figure called JJ Abrams, who um, they, they were amputees. And so children then started having access to disability representation in their toys. Um, during the 80s and 90s, when um, globally we started looking into forming disability legislation and being more inclusive of people with disabilities, we, um, toys like Barbie and Cabbage Patch dolls actually came out with um, toys with disabilities. That children were able to play with and there's a lot of work around adults with disabilities looking back on how important those toys were to them in in their life i mean we can all acknowledge that barbie is problematic for a number of different reasons but to see that representation 
it really means something to people with disabilities. Now, I, um, I've written about this in my work that I became a wheelchair user when I turned 18, and that was in the 90s. And that was when Barbie um, put out Share a Smile Becky, which is you know, Barbie's friend who uses a wheelchair and takes photos of them. So representation is not great, but it was really you know, important for me even though I was too old to play with toys, for there to be that kind of representation. Unfortunately, Share a Smile Becky sold out in two weeks, so I never got one in the 90s. I have two now, so <laughs> I'm a bit of a toy collector. Um, <clears throat> so a really interesting thing that's happening now with toys and disability is the role of parents, of, of children with disabilities and adult activists who feel that disability representation was inadequate in their youth, have started calling on toy manufacturers to um, increase and improve disability representation in toys. So there have been movements like Toy Like Me and um, who have called on toy manufacturers like Lego, Mattel, both in terms of Hot Wheels and Barbies, have responded to this activism and they've put out disability toys that represent disability in different ways. And Barbie has been quite progressive in this space only in the last couple of weeks, releasing a Barbie with Down syndrome. That's amazing. Can I ask Katie just to expand on that? What are the differences then in purposeful versus incidental approaches to representation of disability? Um, oh, uh, do you want to answer this one first, Anthony? Um, so the pur purposeful is, uh, um, I'll clarify what I mean, what, what I mean, what is meant by purposeful. Um, a purposeful representation has specific identifiable qualities of the character and also has consequences to the character, to the interaction of the character and also to the world that the character exists in. Um, that's that's my that's my definition of purposeful. Uh, incidental, uh, as I mentioned before, it just it's the the ticker box. It has no consequence to the world that the character exists in or any interactions with that character. Um, well, what, so to expand on that, what does it mean for a dis for the disability or the disabled community when? they have an overt represent representation of disability and then this covert one that they may recognise in the way that the character is interacting with other characters or it, it's something that emerges in the game rather than is this overt representation. Does that make a difference to the community? Does it, yeah, I, I, I'm just asking what that difference think, might be. I think, I think it does because um, when it's overt, um, it gives the, the person on the disability to say, hey, this reminds me of X, Y, Z. And it puts them in a position to lead the conversation around that character. Whereas if the studio says, oh, this character has Down syndrome or whatever, then it's putting them in the forefront of the conversation. And then they'll, I'll call them anti inclusion crowd, will come down on them. So, are you just doing this for brownie points and you want money? Yada, yada, yada. But when it's covert, uh, we'll be talking about our, uh, talked previously about a character called Symmetra uh, from Overwatch, which it's rated heavy to a more team depending on the, on the rating system, but it has options where younger kids that are uh, eight to 10 can actually pay it because you can turn off voice chat and all that sort of stuff to make it safe for them. Um, but you've got, she's got specific characteristics that make, that make, that make people say, hang on, there's something not, I wouldn't say not right, but there's something that is not socially normal about the character. Uh, and uh, what is it, entertainment? I'll put, they're, techni they're technically a chain media company. Uh, 
company, what that may mean that they do games, books, comics, movies, and it's all, all inter intertwined by tie into each other. Um, that's that's the general gist of trans media. Um, so when you hit some ads, Metro, so when uh, people start playing, it's like, there's, hang on, there's something not, um, yeah, and there's something about the character, and then the, the comics started coming out, and then people would, on the autism spectrum, say, this is me. So would you say that it, it's, it can open a conversation uh, yes. because of its covertness, because of the fact that, you know, people start to think about the character, how they're interacting and seeing themselves in it without it being fully, I guess, um, rammed in their face that this character is, this character has, you know, uh, autism and therefore see yourself. It's more like here's a character and see yourself if you. There's, there's a yeah. chapter in the book gaming disability that looks at this exact character and, and this game. And yes, it really was about the audience and, and the conversation that arose around Smircha and people recognising their own traits of having autism in the character and then, you know, forming a, co a community and a discussion around that, but then also reaching out to the developers of the game and saying, does this character have autism? And the developer responded back and said, actually, yes. But for me, what was so important and interesting was the discussion that people were having and people do this around all sorts of media, you know, TV shows, toys, games, you know. I think maybe that, that person has a disability, feels a bit like me, you know, and then we've been talking this whole conversation about how important it is for people with disabilities to see themselves reflected in the media. So when these types of representations happen, when they might not begin by, by being so out there saying, yes, this character has autism or has a disability, but then when the audience does start recognising that they do, I think something really powerful happens in that conversation around disability. Yeah, and it puts the, puts the audience at the foot there. In, in case of symmetry, it puts people with, you know, on the spectrum at the forefront of that conversation so that they have the opportunity to lead and teach others. Yeah. Um, before we move into the last question, I, I actually was really interested in, in, in the part that you talked about the overt representation and how, um, you know, it's, it's a tokenistic, yes. right? I'm wondering, have there been good examples or, or have you, you know, have you seen communities that you can relate, that related to those um, representations well? Um, well, actually, yes, I, I, I can say that I have. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, Mass Effect as an example. It's not really a kid's game, it's more for the more teen and teenage or whatnot. But there's two characters in there. Um, in particular, uh, one is Jeff, uh, Jeff Moreau, Jeff Joker Moreau, that's his, that's his full time is Joker, and the other one is uh, Jennifer, her last name is unknown, but she goes by the name of Jack. Um, and with, with Joker, it's like, okay, he has something that resembles brittle brain disease, um, and he's like, well, yes, I have this, but it's given me all this extra stuff that to compensate like he's the best pilot in his in his uh, in his fleet because he has to learn to avoid damaging himself just in general day in every day and he's he's expanded that into mm. the ship that he pilots. Yeah. So um Getting himself out of extreme danger in the safest way possible. Mm. Um, and that falls over to other people with brain, brain disease who, are, who I've known over the years. Um, they do similar sort of things. Um, so they have, they go do about, go about their daily lives and whatnot, but they still have to be spatially aware mm. where they're going, who they're around to protect themselves yeah. in a bubble kind of thing. Um, 
and then with uh, with Jack, it's um uh, it's opposite end of the spectrum. Which is where Joke has got a physical disability. Jack has got a mental disability, but hers is induced rather rather than being uh, a product of bad genes and, and to to use to use basically tortured as a child and it that's how she grew up and like I'm not a good person because of this and the majority of the game she distances herself yeah. from people so she doesn't hurt them. Yeah. Um and I know I do that a lot as well because uh, because of the way I grew up of not of not really having much more of social interactions. I I would say that I I am socially stunted. Mm. And for that reason I do keep people away. It's like I do not know how to interact with this person in a safe manner. Mm. But I will distance myself. Yeah. And I do come off as a complete jerk for doing that, but it's for the safety of myself and for those around me. Mm. And so seeing these characters, how, you know, how do they make you feel? Um, there's been times in that in that game where I've actually been fighting back tears because of how much it hits me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Professor Ellis will, um, has had moments of like that when she's been studying games of like this is this representation this situation that the character's in that I'm emotionally invested in is so powerful that it will actually make you want to cry. Mm. Mm. Um, Kate, I'm wondering if you have any anything to respond to that? Yeah, look, I think Angie's just really demonstrated how important it is for us, and this goes back to the first question, why, did, why does this even matter and why are academics talking about it? These are the reasons why, you know, there there are people with disabilities consuming media, media just like everyone else, and it is affecting them in, in different ways, while at the same time, you know, we could be doing something different with these games, showing people with disabilities, and especially children with disabilities, that they are included, that they, they can get there, they can play there, they can stay there, right? So I think that what Anthony has described, and he is much more knowledgeable about specifics of games, than I am is really important and a really important part of this conversation. And, you know, I 100% agree that, yes, I have consumed media and been so affronted, you know, even now, many years later, about the representation of disability. It actually really does matter. And with, you know, with each new game or new format or new type of media, these things, the problematic tropes are repeated again. So we have to keep talking about it in yeah. this way. Yes, yeah, so, and this is a really good segue to the next question, which is really around you know, the future. What what do we think the future looks like for children, um, disability and gaming? And maybe I'll throw it to Anthony and before we go to Kate. Um, okay, so that's that's a really interesting question um, because there's been a lot of, the, the industry as a whole is in the state of flux at the moment um, for several different reasons. Um, so as as the pandemic hit and everything started shutting down, shutting down, going to remote, it, remote, um, remote access and whatnot, it gave people like myself, it, it put them in position to actually be part of the studio and actually impart themselves on how the characters are created. Um, and that's sort of that really depends on the game. As I've mentioned before, there's most games, most studios won't go near it because of the backlash that they'll get if they either do it or do it wrong. Um, but for uh, okay, the, another uh, another game is uh, so it's for older audiences. So it's called Hellblade. Um and the main character there was actually designed around people with psychosis that, that I was actually I was taken directly from the observations of people, people with psychosis and it's directly in the character in the game. Mm. Um, 
So that's the way this year, that's the way some seniors are heading. And as people see themselves being included in game development more and more, it's creating a situation where it's becoming more and more acceptable to have disabled characters um, either both overtly and covertly, uh, more so covertly, because it, this is now a new conversation uh, around those characters. It, uh, it seems to be more common to be covert uh, representation rather than, rather than over, even though there is is a place for over representation. There's mm -hmm. definitely a place for over, over representations. That just doesn't seem to be where the industry is heading at the moment. Um, but do you hope? Do you hope that it will? It, it is definitely going that way. Yeah. It is definitely going that way. Um, and as kids see themselves in the game uh, to a degree, and that degree will increase with each it, as new people come to the industry, um, and it will eventually evolve to the point where it is reasonably commonplace to have a set character. Mm. Um, there is pushback on that though, and I have to I have to say this that um, because the decentralization of studios was really good for set the set developer to be part of the game development process and be a guiding light kind of thing. But a lot of studios are pushing back on that because they want people to be in their buildings. Uh, in their studios and whatnot, and it's cutting out the same for developers. In that, reset, in that sense, it's going to be going to step backwards. Um, and there's a bit, of, a bit of a war going on between some studios and the developers because, mm. like, a couple of days ago, it was a Blizzard Entertainment, the trend media company, um, they issued a statement that. Some of, their, some of the stuff that they have planned is no longer going forward because they, they no longer have the personnel to do it. And the reason for that is because they're trying to re-centralize the studios. We're not, we're not doing this again. Yeah. And so the, stu the, the developers are fighting back. Um, and that, again, puts people like myself directly in the conversation, mm -hmm. like, hey, We've been saying you don't need to centralize here. We've been saying this for years. And then we prove it. And now you've got developers saying, hey, we do not want to do this. We do not want to recentralize. Yeah. And so it's kind of pushing the studio, the studios to do or die, yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Um, that being said, though, there's, especially for, for the, the big five, Blizzard is included. Okay, it is they're damaging themselves, but they can't. And they they are they are damaging themselves. There's no there's no two two ways about that. But they cannot be allowed to damage themselves to the point where they no longer exist because it will cause a cascade and mm -hmm. take a lot of people with them, yeah. including people like myself. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting kind of conversation because it's around this this the actual representation by the people who are actually creating these representations and they're saying that you know that there should be developers who are in the state in those positions to to create better characters yes. that, that represent um well by people with disability yes. yeah yeah that's interesting um katie what do you think uh I agree. I also want to answer this question by reflecting a bit on the process of editing the book Gaming Disability. So edited collections you know, always take much longer than what you think. But with this one, we were interrupted by a global pandemic. And uh, what actually happened with that was that ch chapters that were in the book actually had to change and respond to how gaming changed because of the pandemic. So Tama and, and Catherine Locke wrote a chapter on Pokemon Go and, and what they, they found was that they had to include a new section at the, at the end of the chapter describing how Pokemon Go had actually become more accessible to people with disabilities 
because of the pandemic, because, you know, um, people with disabilities had been calling for certain accessibility measures in po Pokemon Go for a very long time. They were ignored. But then with the pandemic, when everyone needed those accessibility measures, they were then included in the game. So that's a really, a really interesting thing that happened during the pandemic that, you know, different, uh, several different chapters had to respond to how, you know, the situation is changing for gaming and disability. So um, I think that the future is actually looking pretty good. You know, we've got people like Anthony working in this space, agitating for change. Anthony's not the only one. There are lots of other people with disabilities getting involved in game design. So we've got chapters in the books, in the book, um, authored by teachers who are outlining the ways that games have been used to um, develop models to enable more inclusive education for children with disabilities. We've got chapters looking at the way people with disabilities see themselves represented in games and then reach out to the developers to get that confirmed. We have people with disabilities consulting on representation. Um, and we have a, a lot of chapters looking at the way people with disability have become involved in game accessibility, either professionally or by, or by creating communities where they then create accessible ways into games or share accessible ways of playing games in the absence of more official accessibility. So to come back to three points that I um, started my answers with, um, games are becoming more accessible. People with disabilities are forming inclusive communities, getting to know one another, um, forming friendships and agitating for change. And um, representations are becoming more frequent and inclusive in games. We are seeing more people with disabilities. I would agree with Anthony that there is still work to do, but I feel positive that there are people doing this work now where they might not have been in the past. Hey, Kate, can I, can I ask, because this is, this is just in relation to how Anthony answered the question when you talked about the pandemic and then it's basically going back to, to you know, pre-pandemic times yeah. and what happened. I'm wondering whether uh, you see, you know, moving forward that would happen as well in some in some aspects yeah there's a real danger that will happen that we made things accessible during the pandemic because everyone needed it and now in the you know rush to get back to a, a, a normal or a new normal or a different normal people with disabilities are at danger of, of being excluded again in these ways i think it, there's a danger but we there are also, you know, loud voices in this space. Mm. Mm. Great. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. Um, as, you know, per the future, I play Sims with my daughter a lot and there's definitely some new representations in Sims. Um, we've got uh, definitely a diversity in um uh, trans representations, the new, the new sort of signature family, in fact, for the new release, um, Growing Together is a Trans Family, wasn't announced, wasn't anything. It was one of those um, subtle introductions and um, it's very welcome. Uh, the, you know, I haven't seen any characters in wheelchairs yet, but I have definitely, we've definitely got personality and um, social differences and social aspects to them. So it is, it is getting better. Um, but yes, there is work to do. I'm going to open the floor now to questions. If you, if anybody has questions, um, I can see there's an extra thing gone into the chat or is that you Tama? Yep. That's Tama giving open access to his chapter in the book. Thank you, Tama. Um, does anybody at Wollongong have any questions, Rebecca? Not that, not that I can see. <laughs> Can I ask then, I, I'm going to ask a question, it's because the Centre of Excellence itself is focused on very young children, um, and uh, look, my children started playing games at a young age, I'd say by five or six, we were playing on iPads and we were playing different games. Are you aware of any representations of disabilities for very young children in games or how that might be best happen? Um. 
there's no games that I can think of off the top of my head that would have a representation of someone with a disability that is aimed at the, this particular age group. Um, that's what they're saying that there's not seen it. Um, but there's definitely, there is definitely a um, opportunity to make it happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, it would have to be in consultation with people from the community that you're trying to represent in order to, for it to be done correctly and not be completely tokenistic. Um, but again, that relies on people being in their right position to actually advise on that. And while there are accessibility consultants, they're more concerned with on how the game is played rather than the characters that are in the game. Um, that being said, there, from my from my understanding of the industry, there is more people with not apparent disabilities than there are people with with apparent disabilities. Uh, when I say not apparent, I mean things like uh, autism, um, psychosis, things like things that are not visible to people who don't know what to look for, but uh, for example, uh, so if, uh, if you've been somewhere around someone who uh, an autistic person, person for long enough, you, you kind of get a sense when they're getting overloaded um, and it's like, hey, come on, step back, we'll go somewhere else. You, you, learn that, you learn that sort of thing about being around people. Um, and there's just the, the young kids, the, the characters towards younger kids, but there's, there's not, not a whole lot of people with apparent disabilities in the industry who can actually advise on that. But that being said, there's people with uh, a not apparent disability, such as fibromyalgia, who are, I know a couple of people who have uh, psychosis uh, um, and other various mental disabilities. That's also quite I won't say prominent, but in terms of uh, in terms of disability, uh, disabled people in uh, in game development, there is a significantly higher portion of people with mental disabilities than uh, with physical disabilities. Um, apparent disabilities. Um, oh. I might just um, redirect the question now to Katie, but um, Petra Stock has actually sort of expanded it somewhat in the chat. And she's asked if there's a special need for younger children to have games with good representation of people with disabilities, or is, is it the same for all ages? I'll give that I to think, you, Katie. I think we all need it. I think we, we all need to see representation of disability in games. Um, it's great for children who are you know, using games to try out new things, learn teamworks, set goals, things like that. Um, I think it's just it's just important for all of us, 20% of the population to have a disability. We should be included. Um, and Sue Bennett has asked, are there any differences of representation of disability between different cultures internationally in games? I'll start with you on that one, Katie. Yes, we have, um, look, We've got some chapters in the in the collection that look at China, um, and those one of those chapters is looking at the kind of attitudes that circulate around different groups of people using games and um, sort of a cultural expectation that you will not play games. There are other social roles for you to play. For example, if you're part of the aging community, um, and there's another chapter. On, on a specific game from China called Tingu, um, whereby a whole community of people with vision impairment basically recreated the game and made an accessible version and shared with one another how they could access that game and participate in that game. So these, my answer doesn't really address representation, but there are definite different cultural uh, approaches to disability in game that, that we did try and address in, in the book. Um, Anthony, have you anything to respond to that question? Uh, no, right. Professor Ellis got it all in one. That there's, yeah, there's definitely cultural differences in the uh, way disability is represented. Um, 
and it's not uh, it's not just it's, it's not just culture it's also a bit of time frame as well because uh different societies that different time period different society different different uh, um cultural norms different access uh not when i say accessibility uh different cultural norms um different uh cultural acceptability yeah um yeah um, I've got another question here, uh, and this is Con Guskos. I hope I said your name correctly, Con. Um, I would like to ask about the state of accessibility for consumers with a disability in online games. Do you see an increased desire in de the developer scene to expand accessibility features to online games, especially competitive-focused ones? Thanks. I'm going to um, say mixed. Mixed. mixed okay commitment sometimes i think there is a, a huge change in the level of commitment and that um, developers are really committed to putting out accessible features in games and you know we see the work of able gamers really making change in this space and then a game will be released that's not accessible to people with disabilities you know through through the most simple basic things we know about accessibility so Still mixed. Still mixed. Yeah. Anthony? Um, there's, a, there's a huge cultural difference, difference between the CEO and developer. the developer. The developers, if the, if the economy allowed it, they would just make games. Um, and majority of developers want to make games that just, because of how to have a, twist on a story that they want to tell and they want people to play that game. Um, whereas the studio is more concerned of, of concerned of whether or not we can afford to do this, will it impact our bottom line, bottom line and developers of it's like, well, yeah, okay, we understand that you need to meet, need to meet the bottom line, but if you can, you should because it expands the audience of the game. Um, and then you'll, you'll, you'll have people saying, oh, it's just tokenistic and you just want money and all that sort of stuff. You no, know, we want people to pay out games. The money is just, a, uh, the, money, the income of money is just a consequence of the action of people wanting people, people to play out games. Um, because when it's done correctly, when it's done right, and people can actually connect to the characters, they will buy the game. Um, I know of uh, a few games. Uh, one was uh, with um, I can't remember the name. I can't remember the name of it, but it was it was designed where the main character was was deaf, and it had very muted sounds, and in some cases it had no sound at all. Um, and amongst the deaf community, it was took off like wildfire because they saw themselves like, hey, this is, you know, we know we know this stuff like the back of our hand. But then we had people like, uh, people come up to have complaining and whatnot. And so that's like, so they released, released a version that actually had proper sound as like, and the deaf community like, why did you do that? Um, so yeah, there, there's, there, there's definitely a conflict between developer and the studio um and it sounds like the audience as well as to what the audience will um the you know. audience. yeah um, yeah okay um if there's we've got time for one more question if anyone has it if not i'll wrap it up um i think that might be it i want to say thank you to everyone for attending today um really really pleased to see you all here and really say thank you to katie and to Anthony again, especially Anthony's made the trip down to Wollongong to be here. Um, I also need to thank Rebecca and Maddie, Madeline Dobson from Curtin. They're part of the edgy team and the three of us really combined our wonder triplet powers, shall I say, uh, to, to make the event happen. Um, and behind the scenes, Anthony and Katie were very generous with their time uh, helping us get it all together. So again, thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to wrap it up now and say bye-bye.